This is the second video for week eight. In this video, I want to finish what we started with, um, you know, last last time I, I talked a little bit about Jerusalem. In this one, I just want to make a couple comments on Qumran, Masada, and Herodium. It's not going to be as detailed as the other video. Just a couple of things I wanted to mention, and, and that's about it. Uh, let's start with Herodium. I've got two images here on the screen. Hopefully it's not too busy. But this one on the right-hand side, this is what's left of Herodium now. This is a, a more recent image. And I want to kind of point out the layout. You've got this... Um, this square uh, courtyard type thing where there have been pillars and the pillars are visible here then you've got your reception hall if you've read in your books about uh, a galley style synagogue this is actually um, this, is, this is it it was originally a reception hall which later turned into a a, uh, uh, a synagogue um, and uh, then you've got, of course, your massive towers. You, ca you can't see this here, and um, this reconstruction here also isn't showing this, but there are also massive, massive cisterns underneath, a, a huge um, uh, network of these massive tanks that held water. Um, l like your books mentioned, water was brought here by... Um, an incredibly sophisticated network of of aqueducts, but the the fortress itself also had a large wa uh, water supply, and like everything Herod did, it was just uh, the most uh, elaborate, uh, beautiful architecture uh, you can think of. Uh, I want to point out one feature: the entrance is still here now. Um, these these steps. Uh, aren't the original entrance. So you can see here there's uh, you know, this little modern uh, scaffolding here but the entrance was down here and you would enter here into the center of the circle and the first thing you would see was this beautiful courtyard letting in sunlight from the top. So this is where you would come in from the angle here. The sun's coming down from the top. There was uh, all kinds of greens, possibly a little fountain or um, or, uh, or much larger. There was a foot washing place around here. I think it's this room here. So you just walked into just this beautiful green uh, courtyard and uh, that that's kind of Herod's style. He took that into consideration. What was the first thing you saw? How beautiful was it? Uh, what what was the design on the walls? Herod um, was just really an incredibly magnificent um, a builder. Um, the other the only other thing I wanted to point out was this this is where Herod was uh, Herod's tomb was found. Uh, Ehud Netzer, who was doing the excavations here a few years ago, uh, actually Netzer died. Uh, you've probably read in your books. There's, there before <laughs> this was here. It used to be just these like uh, wooden um, platforms, and they were really shaky. Uh, in fact, when uh, when I go uh, to visit Herodian, it's it it does feel really shaky, and um, and unfortunately. He had uh, he was unstable. He put his hand on one of the rails and fell off in this area, and uh, he passed away just a couple of years ago. Looks like from this picture, if this is this might be pretty modern. They might have updated that. Uh, anyway, all that to say that Netzer had actually found a tomb uh, in the construction. It it wasn't open when I was there last. Uh, I'll be going here in November in just a couple weeks and hopefully some of you will be coming with me in in June but the 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 tomb area or the mausoleum is is now open and visitors can go and check it out it's been mostly uh, defaced and and completely robbed but there is you know the the room itself is there and I don't know much about it just because I've, I've never seen it or and haven't read too much about it uh, the the comment I really want to 
uh, make now is uh, this idea that Herod was trying to kind of copycat the the pharaohs of, of Egypt. A lot of people have this idea that Herod was was such an egomaniac. He, he was so, so crazy, really, that he really saw, he wanted to compare himself to the pharaohs. And that Herodium, uh, one of the reasons it was so beautiful and, and this idea of building upon a hill is he wanted his own little um, pyramid type of burial place. And so um, that's kind of the mentality behind this. And, and there is sort of that cutting away into the um, into this massive uh, hill that leads into the mausoleum underneath it. Uh, all that kind of fits this idea of a uh, pyramid type thing. Uh, so I always thought that was kind of an interesting uh, thing to know about Herod. And if you can find a reconstruction of the uh, of Herodium, I think it'll give you a much better idea of what of of what it looked like. And uh, Herod entertained international guests here. So uh, suppose uh, Cleopatra was going to come over and. Uh, harass him a little bit. This is one of the places where he would have entertained them, uh, entertained her, Mark Antony, who knows. Anyway, uh, that's Herodian. Now, uh, let's. I guess let's go look at Masada. This is... modern-day Masada, or what's left of Masada. I want to point out these three tiers here. Um, I want you to capture the height here. Those of you who live in San Diego, Masada is about the same height as Cal's Mountain. Uh, and it's a much, much steeper path. There's the snake path. It takes about a 45-minute hike, but not because it's longer, but because it's steeper. It, it, it is a, a tough, climb, tough climb up here. Um, on the top left-hand corner, that's the Dead Sea. So you really have a great view of the east. I'm sorry, yeah, the east from here and also from the west. Uh, this Herod made Masada into just essentially an impenetrable fortress. The fact that the Romans got to Masada isn't to take away of the fact that it really was impenetrable. Uh, the fact that they got to it just really speaks more to a Roman ingenuity and... Um, the juggernaut that was their army more than to more than it takes away from how impenetrable Masada was uh, on the little edge here on the right hand side you can see the remnants of that um, of that siege ramp the Romans built and it it really was just massive uh, I the the book does doesn't really tell you how incredible was it the Romans um, took Masada, but from up here, you can look down, and if you can see this tiny little square here, on the left-hand side of the picture, that's one of the Roman camps. Uh, they The Romans were so meticulous when they sieged an area. They, uh, they had the exact same layout for every single camp. They, they were just they had warfare down to a science. And um, when the Romans got there, think about how massive a structure this is. I mean, this isn't tiny. The Romans built a wall completely around the entire mountain. And they set up camps, walled camps around the whole thing. And when you're up here, it's like looking down from outer space. And the Romans had just built a wall that really went up into these cliffs. I mean, even the cliffs are walled so that uh, the the zealots who were up here could not escape. Uh, it's, it's really just unbelievable what happened. Uh, a couple of the comments. These uh, platforms here are reflective of, of that palace you've probably read about in your books. I, I forget if the books have... A reconstruction of the palaces but this is sort of what it would have looked like um, you know if you can I'm trying putting side by side here 
but here you have uh, this lower portion is down here you've got your cylind cylinder type section here and this was intended to be one three layer palace uh, that's very beautiful okay one last thing about Masada the book will say um, the, the, the story about Masada is that these zealots were holding out and uh, the Romans came uh, they worked their way up to Masada um, they broke down the external wall here on the on the western side they came in and uh, right around here they found a pile of food and all these uh, uh, Jews had committed suicide and the idea was that the Jews had committed suicide because um, and they, they would rather die than be taken uh, into slavery by the Romans and they wanted to take away the satisfaction of being of given of giving this Roman satisfaction of killing them and then they left this this uh, pile of food for the Romans to recognize that uh, that they didn't die or they didn't die of starvation but they were just kind of throw it in the face of the Romans that they weren't going to get the satisfaction of killing them one last way of pissing off the Romans if that's what ha if that's what's happened it certainly worked the Romans um, would have not taken this lightly uh, the, the only problem with this is the excavations revealed another siege ramp uh, on the other side of this palace wall here and there was also uh, bodies found in the, in the palace complex so um, another alternate view which um, and I, I don't know how popular it is among archaeologists but the only reason the Romans would have built another siege wall within the complex itself is if the Romans, uh, or the Jews had not committed suicide and actually had just retreated to the other side of the wall. And once they got to this palace complex, they built another siege ramp, went in, and finally were able to slaughter everybody. That second story uh, seems actually more realistic than Josephus' account. Um, the Jews were extremely against uh, suicide, uh, being that the Zealots were so religious as well uh, and so fanatical against the Romans. It seems very unlikely that they would have just killed themselves. Um, they they probably would have most likely fought uh, to the last man. So, um, despite the uh, the fact that Josephus has his account uh, and and it is a pretty good story. Um, some archaeologists think, and, and again, I don't know how many, that what actually happened is uh, the Romans barged in, the, the Jews hid out in the palace complex, and they were actually fought the last man, finding, uh, to the last man standing, kind of a thing. Anyway, um, I think that's kind of interesting. And like your book said, when, once the, those bodies were found, it was just assumed by the archaeologists that, that they were Jewish. I think that's the consensus still. But there are some, some archaeologists that think that that's actually the Romans as a garrison there from when the Zealots first took uh, Masada. And if so, when the Jews in, uh, I think, in the 60s, 7s or something like that, they ended up... Uh, giving those what they assumed were the zealots the zealot corpses they end up giving those zealot corpses full military rights and then reburying them uh, full military burials uh, well some are wondering if the Jews or the modern Jews accidentally uh, gave Roman soldiers full military burials but we'll uh, we'll leave that for history to figure out this uh, let me bring up a couple images here. Here we go. Let's see if I can spin this on. Great. Uh, you have pictures of, of Qumran, of the, you know, of the hills. I wanted to show you images of the complex, the layout of the complex. Um, 
Kumran is is pretty sophisticated. There's a lot of a lot of uh, buildings and um, and rooms and uh, a lot of stuff there. So um, I wanted to give you an idea of what the of the of the complex looks like. I do want to show you a, a large cistern over here. This aqueduct comes in from the wild Judean wilderness and waters. Uh, these various pools. It's it's really kind of it's really cool when you visit because this cistern actually um, had uh, all these outlets for all these different baths and and the rooms. There's actually like a working toilet in one of these. I I can't see from here where the toilet is, uh, but there is. There's a toilet somewhere around here, um, and of course there's these baths. What I wanted to show you is uh, one of these. Here it is. You can see this bath here. Now, bath isn't the right term, and uh, I hope um, after this class you start thinking in terms of a mikveh for religious baths. Uh, a mikveh is a ritual bath, if you will. Um, and this is the baptism before baptisms. Baptism is, is the uh, Greek term for immersion. That's what Christians call a bath, uh, a certain, you know, religious bath. But before um, the Jewish Christian uh, Christians had re um, envisioned or uh, connected the ceremonial bath with the, with an initiation rite for Christianity, um, the the this idea of being purified in water was was a huge huge part of Jewish religious life, and so you have these mikvahs or these religious pools all throughout Jerusalem. Uh, they go they're they're in Galilee. They're just all over the place, really. And uh, I want to show them to you because this is what the debate about. What are these pools used for? There's modern archaeologists, are, are some of them, it's a minority view that these pools were actually ink wells or, or mixing, mixing wells where water and ink created the, the combination necessary for, for all the writing that was done here. But you've got your little d dividers. And so uh, what, what actually happened in a mikvah was you would come down the right side, um, well, you would stand up here and you would remove your clothes uh, because in Jewish belief, if you're unclean, like let's say you go and touch a dead body, you become unclean. Well, now you've got to go take a mikvah before you go to temple. So you would take off your clothes. Um, I'm sorry, because you become unclean, anything you touch becomes unclean. Your clothes, your pots, all that stuff. Uh, so, in order to become clean again, you've got to go, you've got to take off your clothes because they have been, um, become unclean through touch. And then you come down, you take a dip. As soon as you come up, you are clean again. And then you go to the right hand, you exit. Uh, well, now the right hand side coming out and you put on the new. Uh, I, I wonder often if this is where Paul gets his imagery of taking off the old man, coming down, being baptized in Christ, coming up a new man, or coming up uh, cleansed, and then putting on Christ. So your old clothes come off, you go down, you're purified, and then you come up and put on righteous, righteousness. Um, but that's uh, just a guess on my part. Cool. Uh, I think that's all I have to say about these. Am I forgetting anything? We talked about Masada, Qumran. Great. Um, just one last final note. The fact that there were people here at Qumran making copies, that's obvious. Uh, all that stuff is there. There's, there's all these tables for writing and, and scriptoriums. What's not sure, what people aren't sure about is who it was that was doing all the writings. So Josephus talks about a party called the Essenes. Whether or not Qumran was an Essene installation or not, that's the debate. That's what nobody's sure about. There is no writing on the wall that says, hey, we are Essenes. 
uh, were awesome. So the question is, who was doing all the writings? The major, uh, the typical guess is Essenes, but um, there's no reason to think it was somebody else. No reason to think it wasn't somebody else. Could have very well been. It could have been a prof professional uh, installation, so it was just a professional scribe's work there, and that's just what they did. Um, but uh, the religious text there, and it made it seem more like a cult than a, than a professional place. So uh, anyway, I uh, hope you found that interesting, and uh, contact me if you have any questions. Cool, thanks.